invited you here. We ask your spirit to come. You always respond to your people. And from the voices that I could hear, all of us in this room have made a declaration here tonight that we're going to choose to follow you. Lord, you said you came to set the captives free. And I believe tonight that many of us are going to go walking out of jail tonight as we follow you. I guess probably everybody in this room has heard a sermon before maybe read some of the Bible at some point. Well, Lord, tonight we want you to really, really, really speak to us. Sometimes we can listen but not hear it. Sometimes we can look at it and not see it. But what we're asking tonight, Lord, is that we would see you. And we'd see you lead us out of the jail cells that we're in and bring us to freedom. Who the sun sets free is free indeed, Lord, and not just by your word, Lord, we wanna experience the freedom that comes with living in Christ tonight. Many of us are bound up in chains, torturous chains of addiction and hatred and self-loathing the list goes on and we want to be free Lord we don't want you to be a a fairy tale God a God of good stories and kingdoms but a God who reigns and a God who sets us free so we might live the way you've designed us to live not in bondage but in freedom children of the king co-heirs with Christ to all that God has. That's what we want. Do a mighty work here tonight, Lord. Do a mighty work. And Lord, you said if we ask for things in the name of Jesus, that we're going to get them. And so we're asking for this freedom and this voice that we would hear, and this God that is real, in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Awesome. Everybody doing well? Good, 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 good. Good. Hey, Mr. Kyle. How's it going, buddy? Good, good. Awesome. So so tonight we're going to... uh, jump back into a a series that we started a long time ago and um, it was it was Christmas you know and and New Year's and all these new things we had to talk about and and um, but God has laid out his word perfectly it's in perfect order and we've been studying through the Sermon of the Mount uh, in Matthew chapter 5 and we're going to go back there tonight so why don't you grab a copy of God's word and uh, turn to Matthew chapter 5 I want to welcome Everybody who's here, and I want to welcome everybody who's there on Facebook watching us live and whoever would watch it in the coming weeks. Glad that you're here with us as well. And so, um, turning to Matthew chapter 5, we're, 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 we're studying the Sermon on the Mount. Why, why did Jesus go up on this little mountaintop to teach these disciples some things? He, he wanted to teach them how to live. This is how you live. Human flourishing is what's on the line here. He wants us to learn how to live. And so he's called up the, he called up all the people up onto the hill. There was a big crowd. But if you remember, not everybody went up on the hill, did they? Uh, not everybody is a disciple of Jesus. Some people are fans of Jesus. They think he's cool and a uh, great story, but I'm not going to follow him. But what we're looking for here at our church is disciples of Jesus Christ, right? Ones who, who, who follow him wherever he goes and they speak the way he speaks and they think the way he thinks and they do what he does. That's what we're looking for here. 
And so Jesus is looking for that back then, and he called the people up, but only the disciples came up on the hill because they're the ones who want to live for him. They're the ones who truly want to follow him, and that's what he's calling for tonight. And so we go up onto the mountain with Jesus. We ascend the mountain into the presence of Jesus Christ, and they sit down before him, and he's teaching them how to live. And who else would we turn to for that, right? Who, where else would we go for Jesus has the words of life? And so Jesus goes up on the mountain, and he sits with his disciples as he sits with you here right now. And uh, so we're back here in Matthew chapter 5, and I would like for you to turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. That's where we're going to pick up. That's where we left off. Okay? And so here we are up on the mountain. You're sitting at Jesus' feet. Uh, don't just think because I'm standing up here uh, that you're at my feet. You're not at my feet. Say you're not at my feet. No, not at all. You're at Jesus' feet. And the, the writing is in red, and we should listen. And this is the creator of heaven and earth speaking to you personally right here, teaching you how to live. And so this is what he says. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. That's kind of tough, right? Who likes that part already? Yeah, no hands go up. I didn't think there'd be any. Jesus is always making us do stuff we don't want to do, right? If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Now normally as I was preaching through this series, I was preaching on this one little section, right? That's what we were doing. Here's the law. Jesus says here, you've heard it written, but this is what I say. Because each one of them was kind of separate. But as you're going to see as we read on that really the translators, the people who wrote teaching about revenge and te teaching about love for enemies, that's not divine. That's humans doing that, breaking it up so we can find things. But really there's no reason for those subtitles because you're going to see that the two of them are hand in hand. They're the same. Watch this. Jesus goes on, same mountain, same crew, sitting there talking to him. He says, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. See, there's a way that there's a way you're supposed to live. And it doesn't make any difference how big the cross is on your chain or how big the bumper sticker is on your car or how many Christian t-shirts that you own and walk around saying, look at me, look at me, right? That's not necessarily what a Christian does. There's a way that you're supposed to live, not a shirt you're supposed to wear. And so he's very, very clear that there's a certain way that he wants you to live. If you're going to truly be a child of God, not just what you think you are, but who you really are. Um, so if you don't persecute those, uh, don't, don't, don't hate your enemy, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, in that way you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight on both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. It's getting worse every minute here, man. Probably not because what he's saying is bad, but because what we're doing is bad. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even, this is a bad translation right here, even pagans do. That's totally incorrect. Okay, totally incorrect. Jonathan. Tax collectors. That's what he was saying. Tax collectors. How many people love tax collectors? Same amount of hands went up. Yeah, nobody likes a tax collector knocking at your door saying, I know you earned it, you worked hard, blood, sweat, tears, give me your money. Nobody likes that. And like he, they're the least favorite person. And, and Jesus is like, even the worst person does that. So how good are you when you do the same? And so even... Tax collectors do that. Publicans is the word. Uh, but you are to be perfect. Yikes. 
even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay, so here we are again, Jesus quoting Old Testament law. If you're an Old Testament law buff, you can look up these laws, um, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. That's where you'll find these laws of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There's actually more body parts that are described in the, full, in the fullness of that law. You'll hear more of that. And then hear about loving your neighbor but hating your enemy. That's also in Leviticus chapter 19. And so here's the first thing we need to establish. Like, Why does, why does God give his law? Because this is what's happening in Matthew 5. He's quoting law, and then he's saying, but I say. And so he's further elaborating on this. The word was play ro'u, and I said earlier when we first started, it was fully preach. He didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to necessarily fulfill it, which is the translation that's most commonly used. But he can't fulfill and end something that out of his own mouth said not a word of it will pass until there's a new heaven and a new earth and that's not happening until revelation so don't just look at the law of the lord as something that's up on a wall for us to look at in a courthouse and go ain't that cool it's still in effect out of jesus christ's mouth that's what it says and so he's coming to fully preach that's the last definition of play ruo it's to fully preach. He's not saying the law is gone. He's coming to explain the law. And this is what he's doing again. But why, why the law? Why did, why did God give us the law? I jot down four things. You might want to jot things down. And I love note takers. Right, Kim? It's the year of the notebook. It's the year of the notebook. So jot these things down. He gave us his law. And there's a lot more reasons, but this is just four of them. He gave us his law for identity. You know, if you read the Bible, you're going to see a bunch of nations all throughout Scripture that didn't live as God wanted them to live. And they didn't worship Him the way He wanted to be worshipped. And they worshipped false gods, and they had bad practice. And those weren't His people. So much so, sometimes He'd tell His people, go kill those people. And so He gave us the law for identity. You know, these people over here, uh, the ones who are doing this over here, those are my people. They're living this way, over here, under my rules. You can see them. Listen, the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And, and the Holy Spirit inspired the lawgivers, like Moses, to write these things down. And it's the same thing now, though. The same Holy Spirit of God is now inside of you, so people can identify you as His. Those who are following the Spirit are His kids, right? Right? So it's always identity. That's why he gave us the law. Identity. These people are mine. Those people are not mine. Here's the second thing. It gives us a standard of right and wrong. It's a standard of right and wrong. Romans 3.19 says, The law was given to keep people from having excuses. Excuses from what, you would ask? He gave us the law to keep, excuse, keep you from excuse to show that the entire world is guilty before God. The law of God might have only been given to certain people, but it shows that all people are guilty. There's a standard, right? You know what? You can't have your own standard. You can't have your own standard. You're not entitled to your own standard because the word standard carries in itself the, the truth that it doesn't change, right? It doesn't get altered. You don't have the right to change a standard, right? You can't just, when the cop pulls you over and says, hey, you're going 60 miles an hour, you can't say, no, 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 no. My miles are longer than yours. You can't do that, right? I just got that one just now, by the way. That was God. That's not me. I'm not funny. Okay, so you can't change the standard. Standards aren't allowed to change. We need a, we need a standard that's universal, that's, that's good for all people. And so that's why it says that all people can be without excuse. The entire world is guilty before God. Nobody is right. Here's my standard. All of you have fallen short. Okay? That's why he gave us the law. Here's the third thing. Psalm 19 says of the laws and the commands of God for things. It says that the laws of God revive the soul. It says that the laws of God make wise the simple. It says that the laws of God bring joy to the heart. It says that the laws of God bring insight for living. Let me tell you something. I don't know where you've gone for help this week. 
But if you come in here tonight and you're feeling a little bit down and you don't know how to live and you don't know what to do and you're feeling kind of dumb because everything you keep doing, it keeps messing you up, every single answer to all those problems, it's right here. It's right here. Look no further. Look in the Word of God. He'll answer every question that you have. Okay? Man, people are going to get set free in here tonight, man. I'm telling you. I'm telling you right now it's going to happen. You're wondering what this is? You'll see. Okay? Here's the, here's, that's the third thing. Here's the fourth thing. Jot this thing down. It's the biggest thing. It's, it's the whole reason for the Sermon on the Mount. It's for human flourishing. He made us in his image to be like him. And so he made all these laws. Not for God flourishing. You know, it doesn't make any difference what you do today. God had a good day. Did you understand that? He is absolutely flourishing today no matter how bad your day was. Whether you praised him or cursed him, he had an awesome day. And nothing you could do to change that. And, and these laws are not for him to flourish. It's for you to flourish. It's about relationships. We're made in community, right? You know, the, I know a lot of you often, myself included, think that you're the only person in the world. That the world revolves around you, but it does not. There's 7 billion others who feel the same exact way. And it's due season, you figure that out. And, and so we have to get along. That's what all of his laws are for. Let me ask you a question. Is it good for kids to disrespect their parents? Are they going to get along really, really well if they disrespect their parents? How many spankers are in the room? Come on. Yeah. It's the South. You can still do it. And let me ask you a question. If, if, if they learn to disrespect you and get away with it, how's it going to go with their principal? How's it going to go with their boss? How's it going to go with the police officer? Not good, right? So is it good for children to disrespect? No, not at all. Not at all. So that's why we have a law for that. Is it good to steal from someone? Is it good to kill somebody? It's not really good. We're not going to get along really well if you steal my stuff. Not at all. Is it good to be sexually active with an animal? Say you. Yeah. That's nasty. That's nasty. Want to do that? You guys want to do that? That's really funny, right? Come on, let's do it. That's nasty. That's nasty. Is it? You ain't got, <laughs> got no time for that. They do need. Give me some more stuff. What is it? They need to know. I ain't got no time for that. That's nasty. What else? Demonic. Demonic. Ricky, always bringing it back to the word, man. That's what I love about him. Okay, so... How about this? Is it, is, is, it good, is it solid for relationships if you're lusting after another man's wife? Not good at all, is it? Not good at all. Not good at all. So, so let's just sum it up. Like, Why did God give us rules? Why did he give us laws? Because <laughs> we're all broken. right? We're all busted. Every single one of you is busted and broken, including me. That's why he gave us laws. We're, listen, you just stare. You look in the mirror, you know that. You look at the news, you know that. Everybody ticks everybody off. Let me ask, Listen, you don't have to raise your hand because I don't want to indict you here in court. How many people in here right now honestly hate somebody? You don't have to raise your hand. I said don't raise your hand. The altar's open just for you guys. Yeah. Make room. They need to do some bowing. Hold on. <clears throat> How many people have been cut off in traffic in the last month? How many people cut someone else off in traffic this month? Oh, you're so holy. Like half the hands. Whatever, dudes. We're all jerks. We're all busted. We all, listen, you know these, these rules right here? Disrespecting parents, killing people, stealing from people, maybe not sexually active with animals, let's hope. The lusting after another person's wife or husband. This is stuff we do. That's why. That's why he gave us laws. Everyone is like this. That's why it says the law points out to everyone that you're all guilty. Romans 3.9 says that all people are under the power of sin. No one is righteous. No one is wise. No one does good. That's what God's word says. And the longer you live, the longer you realize God is spot on on this claim, right? None of this, by the way, none of these laws, 
make God the Lord. He is Lord. But the reason why he does this is because, <laughs> this is crazy, in the brokenness and all the raising of hands and I sinned and I cut people off and I lusted after someone else's husband, you were his masterpiece. We were made in his image to be like him and God is not willing that his masterpiece would be jacked up like that. It, you represent the creator, right? He doesn't want you to be a mess. He wants you to be right. And so, let me ask you a question. If you, if you like, a, like a boss who has a sales team and you've got this great product that you're, that you're selling and I've got these awesome microphones and I want to, and I go door, and you send your salespeople out and they show up at your door late for the appointment, their hair is all messed up, their shirt is untucked and wrinkled, and their language is foul, and they don't know the product, right? And he, and he represents you. Is that what you want? God don't want that. And, and you know, your, you know your, your home says a lot about who you are, you know? You know, I'm not talking about like how big it is or, or, or how fancy it is. That just talks about how much money you have, which let me tell you right now, nobody cares about that. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay. Nobody cares about how much money you've got. But your, but your house says something about who you are, right? So when you come into someone's house and you know someone's coming over there to see you, right? You don't want, you don't want to have your house all just cluttered and filthy and, 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 and food wrappers on the floor and roaches crawling. Like you, you tidy it up, right? Because it represents who you are. And it's the same thing with God. We represent who he is. And so he's given us laws and commands to get us straight. That's what he does. And uh, I guess you'll understand this. Who in, who in the room has kids? Who's that? Who has kids, right? Okay. So get this idea of the law, right? Let's try to straighten us out. So if you've got kids, right? So when they're like one and a half, two years old, how do you keep them from... How do you keep them protected from the, from the plugs and the fans in the parking lots? What do you do? Don't do that! Right? Don't do that! Don't touch that! A lot of reasoning in there. How many people are reasoning with a one and a half year old that's sticking a paper clip into the socket? Right? Yeah. Never. There's no reasoning. You know, son, come sit with me. I'd like to teach you about amps. And I'd like to teach you the difference between positive and negative and currents. And this, see this, this green one here? Yeah, that's ground. You don't touch that. Don't do that! That's what you do, right? And you smack them on the hand. That's, that's what we do when we have kids. Why do we do that? You know, the Bible says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Same thing with the plug in the parking lot. We're, 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 Blair came home this week and he taught Jameson and Jackson how to ride bikes. It's awesome, right? So they, they so what does Jackson do? He doesn't care. He's on his bike and he's going to run across the street, right? I don't care about the Mack truck that's coming. He just runs out. So what do you do? Do you reason with him? Stop! My wife's really good at that. I need my microphone to sound like her. <laughs> True that? Thank you, Harry. <clears throat> Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not the totality of wisdom, but it certainly is the beginning of it. That's where it starts, right? And that's why he gave us law. Look here, though, also in Galatians. Turn your Bible to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, talking about the law. Okay. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. This is what it says. Look, the fear of the Lord, the fear of this thing, the fear of the Lord, he gives us laws. Don't do this. Do that. Just trying to help you guys. Not a lot of explaining, just a lot of do's and don'ts. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Galatians 3.23 says this, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody. You see it there? Protection. Don't do that! 
It's not going to be good for you. You're not going to get along well if you steal that dude's donkey. So you're in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way, Paul says. The law was our guardian. King James would say schoolmaster. You see the assumption of ch childhood there, right? You see it, your schoolmaster, your guardian, until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. So, so God gives us commands and laws to help us from damaging ourselves, right? Protective custody, a guardian, a schoolmaster. Is the school in charge of teaching you everything or is mom and dad really? That's their responsibility. But when you send them to school, they're there to oversee them and protect them and guard them in the meantime as mom and dad are teaching them the way to live. And it's the same thing with the law. Until Jesus came and gave us a different way, we have the law to protect us from ourselves. Because if left unchecked and if left undisciplined and left unregulated, it's not good. And with no law, everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And if you want to read a little bit about what happens when everyone does what is right in their own eyes, just pick up a copy of God's Word and read about the history of Israel in like First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, king after king after king after king does what is right in their own eyes and the, the nation suffers because of it. Because there was no standard that was set. Everyone set their own standard, Oprah. Find your own truth. No. There's a standard that needs to be kept. And, and you can't just do what's right in your own eyes. Because when you do, cultures collapse and nations implode. And nations go to war with one another. And, and listen, when, when it's like that, that is not the Petri dish for human flourishing. That's the Petri dish for insane chaos and anarchy. And that's not what God wants. Ever. Proverbs 19.8 speaks of our standard. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You know, a lot of people can see things. That's not what this Bible is saying here. That's not what Proverbs is saying. Where there's no vision, where someone is physically blind, people perish. No, he's not talking about that people are walking off the cliff all the time because they can't see where they're going. He's talking about seeing a standard. If you don't put something before their eyes that they can say, this is the way we're supposed to live, right there. That's where we're supposed to go. That's what we're supposed to do. If they don't have that, implosion. That's what happens. People perish. But those that keepeth the law, happy is he. The law of the Lord was our schoolmaster, our guardian, because we're children and we need rules. No matter how old you are. Are you a child of God? Or did you somehow graduate to teenager of God? Is an 80 year old Christ follower still a child of God? So don't we always need his rules? <clears throat> children need rules for sure. I uh, never wanted any children, honestly. Just wanted to be selfish. Just wanted to have a hot wife and a motorcycle. I got those. I don't get to ride my bike too often. <laughs> but it looks good in my garage. We have six children and two grandkids. Very funny, Lord. <laughs> I'm glad you guys think that's humorous. 
I love, I love my children. I love my family. And God has been blessing us this week in incredible ways, and I rejoice in that. I know many of you do. But, you know, children grow up. They're not always one and two years old and screaming at them because they're Jackson. And, you know, we decided a while back that, you know, I have a job, and many of you have jobs, and I'm here a lot, but I really have two full-time jobs. I have this job, and my other full-time job is keeping Jackson alive. <laughs> it's very, very true. He just runs headlong into danger, doesn't care, doesn't know. And <laughs> children grow up, but parenting has to grow up too. But the reason behind the parenting, whether it's as a child or as a teenager or beyond, the reason behind the parenting never changes. It's always for their flourishing. And Jesus said that he came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And that's what he wants for us. And so what's, we start with basics. No, don't run out on the street. No, don't stick your sister's fingers in the fan. We start with basics and the what to do or what not to do transitions to why you don't do that or who they are. Who are you? The reason why you don't do this is because of who you are. And preventatives like result and repercussion and punishment transition, hopefully, from or else to love, right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but we transition to love of the Lord is the reason why we follow his commands. First, we follow his commands because if we don't, we get hurt. Then we follow his commands because we love him and we want to obey him because of that love. And so there should be a transition from childhood on. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, a lot of us need to grow up. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Hebrews 6, 1 says, let us go on and become mature in our understanding. See, not so much in our obedience, right? He wants us to be obedient all the time, whether it's the law or Jesus' love brewing up inside of you that keeps you from doing it. He wants you to obey that thing. But what does he want us to grow in here in Hebrews? He wants us to grow in our understanding. And that's what he's looking for here. That's what Jesus is doing on the Sermon on the Mount. He wants us to grow in our understanding. You've heard the law, but I want you to understand why. That's what he's doing here in the Sermon on the Mount. And so notice how Jesus transitions the people. Go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, look what he says. Uh, you've heard it said, um, you've heard the law, but I say. Like they knew the law. They knew the law. They understood that what the law was, but he's giving them the why. <laughs> That's what he's saying. You've heard the law, but I say. You've heard the law, but I say. That's why Jesus is transitioning the people from or else to love. And they seem to be, though, here, <laughs> I don't know about you, but for me, um, they seem to be contradictions. You know, the law says to love your friends and hate your enemy. And we all understand that Jesus was the word that became flesh. So the law that came through Moses, whose laws were, were they? J, starts with a J. Jesus, right? So he gave this law to hate your enemy. And then here he is on the mount saying, love your enemy? I thought you were explaining the law. Not changing the law. So, is he changing it? Is Jesus like flipping the switch here on these things? <clears throat> so I have to tell you, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I don't like preaching sections of the Bible because I don't like what it says. And I don't like doing it. And I also don't understand what it says sometimes. You guys ever run into that, or am I the only dum-dum, yeah. right? So I'm reading this thing, and all these other previous lessons on the Sermon on the Mount, he seems to be 
explaining what was. But this one, man, it's pretty, it seems to be like a contradiction. And, and I've been struggling with this for years right here, this one right here. And, and when, I, when I felt like God wanted me to teach you the Sermon on the Mount, I knew this was coming. And I would do anything to take that week off and have Jay preach. And he would, I know he would, because he's a faithful servant of the Lord. But I can't run from that because I made you a promise, and I made God a promise. I would never run from a text. But I knew it was coming. It's been several months now that this is on the front burner of my life and on this church. I knew this thing was coming, and I didn't have an answer for it because it seemed like a contradiction. And so as I started to read more and more, I love the holidays because it gave me a reprieve. <laughs> and I didn't want to preach this. <clears throat> but I was going to get up after reading several times. I was going to just get up and just say, you know, Jesus is God. And this section right here doesn't seem to fit the construct of the previous Sermon on the Mount lessons. But he's God and he can do whatever he wants, right? No. He can't do whatever he wants. He can't contradict his word. Never. Did you know that he can't remember a sin that he's forgiven? It's gone. So don't just say he can do whatever he wants because he's, he's Jesus, he's God, and his thoughts are way higher than our thoughts, and his ways are way higher than our ways, and so he could just, if he wants to switch, he can. That's a cop-up. That's a lazy preacher. And, and how would I expect to, to preach to a church and say, get enthusiastic about your study of God's word, and enthusiastic and dedicated to meditating on it day and night? If I'm going to be lazy, you're going to be lazy. And I don't want you to be lazy. The message of the Bible is in the Bible. You don't need to look anywhere else for the answers. Okay? It's in there. And I'm not going to be a lazy man. You guys ever heard of John MacArthur? Right? John MacArthur is this awesome preacher. He's been preaching for like 50 years. And, and this guy is like, he has more letters after his name than most of us have in our name. He, he writes study Bibles. You know what I'm saying? Like this guy is brainiac theologian. And so he was at this conference one time about preaching the word of God. And so one of these young seminary students stands up and says, Dr. MacArthur, what's your best advice for preparing a sermon? And he just looks at him, just old, wise man, you know. And he just said this. Stay in your seat until the work is finished. That was his advice. Stay in your seat until the work is finished. Don't you dare throw up your hands and go, I don't know. Because it's in there. And God wants you to know. And he wants your people to know. So dig for it. Go after it. Find it. Stay in your seat until you get the answer. Don't ever give up. Find the answer in the scriptures. And so the question here is, is Jesus contradicting? Is Jesus flipping the switch? Is he changing the law because he's God? He can do that? No, that's not the answer at all. The answer, I found it. I found it. It's in there, right? And it's not too far. I don't have to take you to Deuteronomy. I don't have to take you to Revelation. I take you to the same sermon from the same preacher on the same mountain to the same audience. Matthew 7, 12. Look up on the screen. It's the golden rule. It's the golden rule. You ready? You guys all heard of the golden rule? It's all, right? You've all heard of this. What does it say? Do to others whatever you would like to do to you. You've all heard that, right? In one translation or another. Do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you. That's not the surprise. The surprise came in a sentence that nobody reads. Is that the whole golden rule right there? Well, it kind of is. But there's an explanation for it. Look at the next sentence. See it there? This is the essence of all that is taught in the law. What? But I don't get it. You said if someone 
plucks out an eye, I take the eye. If, if someone takes a life, I take a life. If someone hates me and they're my enemy and they're against me and they push against me and they fight against me and they hurt me, I can hate them. What? That doesn't make any sense, does it? That, 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 that doing good to others is the essence of all the law? It certainly doesn't sound like that in the law. But nothing's changed. See, that's, that's the lesson here. Nothing's changed. God's wanted us to flourish as his people since way back. And so he gave the law because he wanted us to be able to get along with one another. And maybe they were used to, to, to put a little fear inside of you so that you wouldn't do that to each other because he doesn't want you to be mean. He wants you to be kind and loving toward people. Love for people didn't start with Jesus Christ's ministry. Love for people was way, way back. All these laws are so that we could get along, so that we could flourish as his greatest creation. Together, nothing's changed and Jesus is explaining the essence of the law. So the law doesn't change. He's explaining what it meant. Why did he have all these rules to do this, to not do that? So we would get along with one another. So we would love one another, right? Why, is the re why are the laws so strict? Why is there so much massive penalty and punishment for things? Did you know that they, if you disrespect your parents, you're supposed to stone your kids to death? Seems harsh, right? Well, why did he do that? So we'd get along. It wasn't to be mean. It wasn't to be a mean God who restricts all your fun. It's so that we could get along. All of us, seven billion of us, are crammed onto this little ball of dirt. We've got to, we have to find a way to get along. So he gives us these laws. But the essence never changed. God simply wanted us to flourish as human beings made in his image. But instead of rules for children, he's using the reason behind the rule as we grow. Listen, if you love God and you love me, you're not going to want to lie to me. You're not going to want to cheat on me. You're not going to want to steal from me. And you're not going to want to kill me. I believe that Jesus originally gave his laws and commands as the vision. Without vision, people perish. He gave them these things as a vision of what people needed for human flourishing. Look at this list of laws. These laws right here. This is how you should live. They put it be before their eyes to see. The author of Hebrews said, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways through the prophets, like Moses. But now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. And I believe that the law was Jesus' original gift to us. The vision that people could see, this is how I want you to live. But I believe what the scriptures would teach us is that Jesus is the new vision that people need to see. He came to, to teach and to live out, play ruo, to fully explain and preach the law, not to change it. God's laws simply reflected God's desire for us to get along and to flourish. You know, um, there's a section of scripture where Jesus teaches us that it's not, he's talking about food really. He says, it's not what goes into you that defiles you. It's what comes out of you that defiles you. And I think that that applies here too. See, the big difference between the law back then and the love that's inside of us now, it's motivation. Not how much motivation, but where the motivation comes from. The motivation used to come from the outside, you know, the outside influences, the rules, the laws, the commands, the repercussions, fear, punishment. That's outside influence on us, whereas now God's Spirit lives in you. And God is love, and so if you love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to do good to them. And you're going to pray for them. 
And you're going to bless them. And you're going to consider them more important than yourself. And you're going to keep your word to them. And you're going to be generous to them. You're going to honor them, encourage them, and help them. And so, like on a practical example, it would be hopefully we transition from I'm not going to speed anymore because I don't want to get any more tickets. It's going to cost me a lot of money to I love Jesus. And he told me that I should keep the law of the land. So I want to honor that love. And I also love people enough that I don't want to drive like an idiot and endanger them. So I'm going to drive with a little compassion. You see the difference? Both things are keeping you in good relationship. But one is fear of the Lord. And one is love of the Lord. And love of people. And that's what he wants us to graduate to. So... Instead of outside influence, it's inside influence. So, Tom, would you come on up here, please? So as we finish up here, I just want to say that what we see here in this sermon on the mount is Jesus. He's transitioning his people from law motivation to love motivation. But the essence of the law hasn't changed. It's for human flourishing. It's for our good. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heaven and earth may fade away, but the word of the Lord will last forever. You know, Jesus was asked about the law. What's the greatest law? You know what he said the greatest law is? Love. He said that's the greatest law. Love. Love me. Love people. Listen. Love yourself. Not in love with yourself. Some people need to hear that. But love yourself. He wants us to act like true children of God. True children of your Father in heaven. So this, it's easy to love your buddies. It's easy to love the ones that act just like you. It's easy to, to love the ones who favor you and help you and are kind to you. But some people do you wrong. I have people in my life that have absolutely torched me. They've done me wrong. Oh, they've done me wrong. And they're going to get theirs. Some of us feel that way. Some people are against me. They're, they hurt me. They've offended me. But I'm a mature Christian. And so vengeance is the Lord's. I'm not going to try to pay him back. But I'm just going to sit over here while the Almighty smites them. I'm going to sit over here and I'm going to just, I'm just going to hate them. Guilty. Anybody? I'm so guilty. So guilty. You guys see a piece of paper there by you? What started out this afternoon as a small piece of paper had to be enlarged because I started realizing how many people that I hate. <clears throat> so this is what I want you to do. I want you to let Jesus set you free. That's what he came to do. He came to set the captives free. And so I want you to take a moment. Of, here's a piece of paper right here. There's pens all around you. There's pens in the back of the pews. There's pens on the tables. Don't waste a moment. Don't waste a moment. I want you to take some time, and I want you to start writing down some names. Write down some names of people that have wronged you, hurt you, that you hate. You know what? It might include yourself. I know oftentimes I'm driving down the road, I had big plans for the day, I get halfway to work, realize I forgot everything I needed. Man, I hate myself. Can't stand myself in that moment. I can't believe the things I've done for people that I love. I can't believe that people I love did this to me. 
Got a list? Jesus came to set you free. And he said, I say, don't hate him. I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you because in that way you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight, his blessing really, to both the evil and the good. He, he, listen, awful people made a paycheck today, just as much as yours, if not more. Awful people, lying, cheating, rotten scoundrels, enjoy the same beautiful sunlight and temperature today that you did. That's what God does. And so if we're gonna be like him, we have to be the same way. And I am, I'm in a life prison of that. A life prison. And I need to be set free of that too. I hate people. It's people that I can't stand. Can't stand them. People in my family, people that are been in my family and not anymore, people who have been in this church and are not anymore. Can't stand them. That's self-imposed prison. And Jesus came to set the captives free. So, write some names down, for real. Don't not do this. Don't not do this. Write names down on this piece of paper. This is what we're gonna do. When you get done writing them down, I want you to crinkle it up, okay? And I want you to put it at the foot of the cross, right here. This one right here. That's for the names that you're not going to hate anymore, but you're going to choose out of obedience to be set free to pray for them from now on. Okay? This is for your offering. So we're going to get quiet here for a moment. We're going to put the lights down a little bit. And I'm going to give you some space to pray. And not so dark they can't write, but write down some names. And then... You can come crinkle it up so nobody has to see it because it might the name on the piece of paper might be the person sitting next to you. We don't want to do that. Don't want any fights in church. So crinkle it up, put it in there, and leave it at the altar, right? You can drop your offering in there. Okay. I'm going to pray with you now and then give you some time to write names down. Here, just listen, just listen and pray with me here, man. Pray with me, pray with me. Let these words be yours. Lord God, we, we realize that you did come to set the captives free. You didn't, you didn't just come to, to, to give us a good story to tell on a weekend. There's a lot of other great things that we could be doing, but we came here tonight not to hear a good story, but to be free from the jail that we have created for ourselves. I know personally the people that I cannot stand do not care that I don't that I can't stand them. They're not worried about it right now. They're not feeling what I'm feeling right now. And so the only person that's in jail is me. Isn't that all of us? So Lord, help us to be free. You designed us, you created us, and then you saved us to be just like Jesus Christ who is absolutely free from all restraint. Nothing holds him back. He is the king over all. The sovereign king of the universe who has all authority. And that king has come to set me free. So Lord, no longer do I want to be held in a jail cell of my own making. I don't want to hate these people anymore. Who is it? Give me the names. Give me the names that I can jot down on this piece of paper and hand them to you. You said to cast your cares upon the Lord for you care. That's what we want to do tonight. Lord, at the same time, we want to invest in your kingdom because there's other people that are walking around town right now in self-imposed prison. 
and they need to know that you are here to set them free. And so, Lord, not only do I want to be set free here tonight, but I want to invest, I want to invest generously so that other people can be set free like I am. People all over this community are walking around day after day with no hope. Filled with hate, filled with vengeance. And Jesus came to set them free. And so tonight, Lord, we want to invest in your kingdom. We want to help those people. We want to consider them more important than ourselves and give to you, to them, instead of to ourselves, in the way that we would give. So, Lord, while you give us names to jot down, to forgive and to love and to pray for and to release, we also ask that you teach us personally how we should invest in this most important endeavor. We ask these things in Jesus' name.